Hello and welcome to today's webinar, DevOps, FedRAMP Compliance, and Making Your Migration to GovCloud Successful. Today's GovCloud webinar will be presented by Jay Boyer, a lead engineer at FB Complete. Jason has developed high throughput distributed computing system for an FDA regulated project. He has also designed infrastructure for various projects at FB Complete from small to large. Following Jay's presentation, we will open the webinar up to collaborate upon GovCloud. Post your questions that come to mind during the webinar and we will address it following Jay's presentation. You may also directly contact us with questions anytime at fpcomplete.com slash contact us. Yes, uh, well welcome this morning or evening or afternoon, wherever you are in the time zone world. As Greg said, my name is Jay Boyer. I'm a senior systems engineer at FB Complete, which means that I spend a lot of time focused on DevOps and Linux and Windows servers and figuring out compliance and making migrations happen and dealing with operations that are specific to GovCloud and for being successful on GovCloud. And in particular, we're going to talk about the nexus, uh, the coming together of DevOps and FedRAMP compliance and a migration to GovCloud and what that means and why you need to consider it or do it. All right, so let's first cover a little bit about what is GovCloud. If you look on the internet and do some research about GovCloud, it'll, it'll, at first it'll probably be a little confusing. Um, and the main reason is because we're sort of spiraling around these two definitions or uses of GovCloud. And we have uh, two general contexts that we use this term in. So one of them is uh, a product or a set of products from different cloud service providers. Um, separate from that, we have the quote-unquote GovCloud uh, initiative uh, as a governmental jurisdiction or as a state agency. Uh, there are different legislations that are, or efforts that are legislative efforts that are going through that are focused on this idea of quote-unquote GovCloud. So we're going to talk about GovCloud uh, within these two contexts. I apologize for anything that's uh, nonlinear. Uh, or that's difficult because of the linear presentation, because a lot of this material uh, is, can be sometimes difficult to um, present just linearly. But we, we need ways of summarizing this, so let's turn to some, some simple ways of describing it. Uh, really about, GovCloud is about an opportunity, right? It's about switching over to the cloud, um, but applying best practices. So we're talking about modernizing, modernizing legacy infrastructure. And we, with DevOps, we want to be accelerating our overall productivity. Uh, so GovCloud is about capturing the essence of uh, DevOps and security and best practices and giving uh, agencies a way of modernizing their uh, legacy infrastructure. And at, at FP Complete, we have a, a significant effort uh, or significant experience helping different agencies and uh, their service providers take care of GovCloud technology and, and actually making a switch over to this modernized world. So we've talked a little bit about uh, cloud service providers. Um, we're going to go a little deeper into what they are and who they are and, and some of their products. Um, but you know, these cloud service providers are, are a mix of different companies that we know of and, and new products that we haven't heard of, but they're all focusing on a, a um, attaining uh, or being compliant with some sort of set of regulations, otherwise follow through with the processes uh, outlined by FedRAMP, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about what that means in a moment. So GovCloud in the U.S. is, is really about FedRAMP, so we're going to talk about that. That's really the thing that I have the most experience with, although it's important to note that other jurisdictions elsewhere in the world, Europe and such, are starting to talk about GovCloud, and they have their own efforts um, which are a little bit different and a little bit further behind, but uh, FedRAMP is the one that gives us something concrete to review and talk about here. So what is FedRAMP? Well, in particular, it's a management program. It's a way of assessing risk and authorizing uh, what specific methods or tools or infrastructure are going to be used uh, for, you know, to, by an agency or, or its service providers to provide uh, the services that that agency provides. Right? So we're talking about data, talking about applications. Um, when we need to migrate these over to, to GovCloud, they could be done and carried out in many different ways. And FedRAMP is, is about 
learning from FISMA, the previous legislation, and about adopting a, a cloud-centric model and being able to uh, very quickly and efficiently move the agency's process of being non-compliant uh, to being compliant and to using uh, approved uh, providers, cloud service providers, or we call them CSPs, CSPs, sorry. So overall, FedRAMP is basically some meta infrastructure or structure for compliance. It's about facilitating compliance. And in particular, this, this is about US government agencies and other publicly regulated organizations. But as we'll see in a few minutes, this kind of, this goes down the line and, and um, you know, as service providers, we are often pulled into uh, the needs that our clients have. And many uh, providers uh, service different government agencies that are uh, you know, beholden to these regulations. So it ends up coming across the board that way. So if we were to break down FedRAMP, uh, some examples of ways of you know, what this is actually including and focusing on, uh, it's, it's all encompassing. It's, it's the entire workflow and administration of the data and the services with respect to IT infrastructure that the organization and the agencies are responsible for. Um, and in particular, we're talking about bringing together the combination of federal agencies with different cloud service providers and the assessment organizations or people or organizations that are responsible for making sure that the cloud service providers actually meet the different requirements and the different agencies are also following through with, with the NIST uh, and other uh, regulatory requirements of them. So as I mentioned a moment ago, FISMA, uh, FedRAMP is really about a, a legacy and, and it's, it's picking up where FISMA left off. Uh, FISMA is the legislation that came before FedRAMP and it's really what we could consider the original legislation uh, in the modern current age uh, for federal infrastructure. And this dates back to 2002. FISMA is, is more uh, focused on the needs of IT at that time, which if you kind of think back, we're talking about almost pre-VMs and that sort of stuff, a lot of on-prem stuff and, and mainframes were even bigger than they are now, not that they've left much, but uh, FISMA has to focus on a, much of the same content, but it was bigger and a bit messier, a little bit all over the place. Uh, the point of this slide, I know it's a little hard to read, but um, what I want you to kind of take away from this is that uh, FISMA was all encompassing um, and, and was in place before FedRAMP. So FedRAMP was about uh, simplifying this and making it a little bit easier for people to go through. So really what the difference between FISMA and FedRAMP are is that with FISMA we're talking about more on-prem and legacy infrastructure at this point and FedRAMP is focusing in on cloud products and deployments, so things that are you know, running on the cloud. FedRAMP itself uh, dates back to around 2011. So, you know, eight, nine years, we're almost 10 years past now. You know, this is a, now all of a sudden becoming a big topic. So I'd like to review a little bit of some of the change we've seen in the last few years and um, why all of a sudden this is kind of more relevant. Um, and the main issue is that there, there needs to be this ramping up. Uh, there needs to be, uh, you know, the first step in the first phase is legislation that creates uh, the need for uh, say cloud service providers to be compliant. And uh, then you need those providers to go out and actually become compliant and you need assessment organizations to go through all that uh, or to provide the assessments and to, to help the cloud service providers go through their assessments and get uh, compliant and all that sort of stuff. So this ramping up as time goes on is a process that, you know, at this point there there is enough of the infrastructure in place uh, for more of these changes to, to slow on, um, pass on through and for more of the agencies to actually do it you know, in mass. So um, these new services, as, as legislation was passed, new services needed to come out. And FedRAMP um, is really the thing that kind of focuses in, us in on what those services are and how to pick and choose between them. Um, private industry really needs time to act. And so at this point, we've really, private industry has uh, responded and there are a number of new uh, providers coming online each year, but at this point, there's enough for us to really get going with Gov Cloud. So at this point, there's, it's really, really open full throttle uh, where possible. And um, agencies are coming down in mass asking and demanding that their service providers make sure that they are quote unquote Gov Cloud compliant within some amount of time. 
and uh, obviously the better agencies are giving more time uh, to their service providers, nor notice, uh, others may not. And uh, we definitely have, have heard about uh, quite the spectrum there. So if we were to summarize FedRAMP, uh, we'd, we'd say, well, FedRAMP, FedRAMP puts it best themselves. This is straight from their website. Facilitating the shift from insecure, tethered, tedious IT to secure, mobile, nimble, and quick IT. DevOps in the cloud in a nutshell, but for the federal agencies. That's what FedRAMP is trying to make happen. So a little secret within GovCloud is that a lot of this is really based on Nest 800 and, and FIPS also 199, but um, you know, uh, the vast majority of these best practices and about the, the security and what it is that we're trying to do have already been in place. And FedRAMP is about pulling these together in a nice, neat, co cohesive package that uh, the agencies and their service providers can go on through. So uh, with, with that in mind, if you understand NIST and if you understand the 800 series docs and if you have applied those uh, best practices or in the process of doing that, a lot of the compliance ends up being a lot easier. And if you haven't done those things, then actually focusing in on being compliant with, with these security, security controls is really the, the focal point of, of um, becoming compliant. Um, there's a lot more obviously to it because compliance is a big picture, but um, the essence of, uh, of say the DevOps or the engineering that's involved uh, is often very focused on these, these details. Um, but the key, the first step in, in all of this is really about identifying the level of impact or the, the, the risk uh, level. Uh, and this is what determines the compliance or the, the regulatory um, regulations that we need to actually uh, be compliant with. So at this point, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different cloud service providers coming online. You know, how do you choose between them? What, what do you do? And uh, what, what, is, what is the way to actually navigate this jumble of, of uh, options? Um, well, the first is that not all of them are actually compliant. So you actually kind of have to dig into it and figure out uh, a little more specifically for you what matters. And uh, in particular, AWS is the one that's really led the charge and is the furthest along. Uh, Azure is not far behind, although uh, GCP and, and some of the other um, service providers do, don't really have a GovCloud offering, although I imagine that we'll see that in the next few years, if not already sooner. Re navigating this abundance of options really is about, uh, well, it, that determines the success of the migration or, or Gov GovCloud initiative. So projects that are focused on GovCloud really require some level of familiarity with not just the application of FedRAMP or compliance and assessments in general, or the ecosystem of DevOps tools and how to integrate them, or the best practices across operations and development, but also the tenacity and, and some sort of discipline to be able to focus on what is actually important, what needs to happen now, what could we do later, and you know, being, being able to stick through this without being getting lost uh, amidst all of that. So this is where success uh, can really be made or lost. I'm going to take a slight pivot for a second and talk a little bit more about uh, the GovCloud region and AWS in particular, and this will kind of help set up some of uh, the next um, section of, of uh, this presentation and, and the topic in general, um, which is more about the difficulties of GovCloud and, and how to be successful. So before we do that, we need to talk a little bit more about what is uh, the GovCloud region in AWS. And so this is a specific provider with a specific products that we're going to talk about, but this generally applies to Azure and the others as well. Um, and it's something that we see uh, is particular to GovCloud. So what is, well, and I guess one thing that's interesting about this, it's just an important point. If you, if you look out and you do research on GovCloud in general um, on the internet right now, you'll, you'll see this marketing material from AWS that talks about the GovCloud region. And it's presented as if it were just another region. Um, or a group of regions that um, you know you could just use all of your the same tools that you have used with all the other regions. Um, you don't have anything else to consider, right? It's just a new region. All of the same services that you've always used are, are available in this new region. Well, it's a little more difficult than that. Let's break down what goes into these boundaries on AWS. Uh, specifically, we have availability zones, regions, and partitions. These three different things we're gonna talk about. 
So availability zones, what are they? They are groups of data centers that are close, like physically close to, to, to one another. They might still be cities apart um, or tens and hundreds of miles apart, but uh, the, these data centers comprise what we consider uh, an availability zone. And AWS has specific SLA requirements for an AZ. A single region, such as you know, US East One or whatever, uh, we'll have multiple availability zones. And uh, generally, you know, it's more than two, but it can be three to five or, or even more. Within a single region, uh, you've got access, your account, your AWS account has access to some set of AZ uh, availability zones. So this is actually a good example of why it's not a good idea to hard code availability zones in your DevOps infrastructure. Because uh, you can go and move to another account and then what was hard coded all of a sudden breaks instead of just being a list of three different availability zones. You've got three specific names and two of those are not actually there. So this can be uh, an actual problem. But anyway, that's, that's separate from GovCloud. These regions, so if we have say US East and, and uh, West and uh, GovCloud is now another region, uh, we have to talk about this partition and the boundary of, of partitions. Uh, so within the United or within AWS commercial, we have uh, regions that are in the United States uh, and around the world in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. But those together are in one logical group, which is called a partition, and that's AWS commercial. There's also a Chinese partition or a, a partition for Chinese regions or regions in China. And there's a GovCloud partition. And I, maybe even probably others as well um, that we don't necessarily know about. Um, for example, AWS probably has a couple partitions, um, some for different testing, like, you know, how does AWS do <laughs> release to different environments, for example, at tap dev stage or, or produ production? Well, it's probably partitions in some sense. And uh, you can see this in the ARN, actually. If you, if you look at an AWS ARN, you'll see a field for, um, you know, your availability zones or your regions, but you also see there's a field right before it for the partitions, and it's usually empty, and that denotes the commercial zone, but every now and then you gotta stick GovCloud in there when you're talking about GovCloud. Okay, so with that out of the way, what makes GovCloud difficult? Well, first, compliance is hard. You've got a lot to pay attention to. Uh, these documents are not easy to read, and you need somebody with a high level of technical expertise who can quickly navigate those details and figure out what actually applies to you. you know, the 800 series of documents are literally hundreds of pages of docs, and you don't necessarily need to read every single page to do that quickly. And in general, compliance and, and paying attention to where you're at in that process uh, what you need to do and documenting it as you go and having a team work on it is a difficult thing to orchestrate. Security is also hard. Um, and, you know, in many places we can cut corners, but this is not one of them. This is not a place where it's allowed, really. Um, on one side, uh, there's compliance and regular. We have the end users that we are, are beholden to and the GovCloud bring that's this is really up you know raising the stakes so to speak right so it's it's this is not well usually i can just ignore ssl on the back end or i can just let that password be hard coded it doesn't matter that it's it's here it's just for dev these kinds of decisions are not okay and devops best practices are giving us tools and methods to be using them uh, but this makes GovCloud hard it, it means that of doing the best or the, the applying best practices and doing what's co correct and right uh, might take longer or be harder and, or more effort than uh, what we're used to or the timelines uh, normally allow. So this makes GovCloud more difficult and any kind of migration to it needs this in, um, in, in mind, especially as the impact levels uh, are, are, are raised, right? As, as we climb up in the level of, of um, risk or impact uh, to the data loss, uh, or integrity of the data, then security becomes harder. Consider. Um, and so just, you know, again, uh, AWS's point on this, she, security is a shared responsibility. This is something that we need to care about, and it's not just on AWS. Um, I see a lot of cloud providers out there love to give this idea that 
yada, 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 you should just use us, and that's great. Um, but in, in one sense, they're just saying, well, if you use our product, you will be compliant, and that's good. And it's a little bit of a misnomer to, to suggest that, uh, because security really is a shared responsibility. Uh, they're doing what they need to to be compliant, but there's also then this line drawn, and we're responsible for a bunch of other stuff. And this is where uh, your vendors and your support network really come into play. All right, so what, what also makes Scub Cloud difficult? Uh, well, in general, if we were to sort of boil this down, we have an oversized migration. By that, we mean that we're changing a lot of things. We're probably migrating to DevOps. We're moving to the cloud. It's GovCloud, not just that. We're maybe using new tools. Maybe it's also containerization. We might need to redo our CI infrastructure as part of this. If we're moving to GovCloud, do we have to move uh, everything, like all of our build and dev um, deployment infrastructure, as well as the actual application hosting infrastructure, or is it just the app? And so all of these, uh, these factors play into a, a migration that is more complicated than what we're used to. We, we, we normally get to isolate what we're, it is that we're migrating, and it's the smallest set of components, right? Maybe it's just the database this time, and maybe next time it's, it's another set of the, uh, of the applications here. But um, with GovCloud, and because of that partition, uh, we're, we're making a bigger leap. And it's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's more of the stuff that we would normally just break into several pieces. DevOps on its own is also hard. Right? This is the kind of thing we, a lot of people come to FB Complete just to get help with DevOps in general. And we see it with every client that we talk to that applying DevOps within the organization is difficult. It's complicated. It's not just a technical solution. It's not just a process or an organizational solution. It's a combination of all of them together. And people need to work together to make those changes happen. We've also talked a little bit about this partition. And um, it's kind of hard to, sorry, that image doesn't really map. but. Um, the partition boundary here is, is something that makes GovCloud difficult because it's not just another region that we're deploying to. Um, for example, in the commercial AWS regions, it's pretty normal to have a database on RES, snapshot the database, and then go deploy it somewhere else uh, from the copy of the snapshot, right? Like we will deploy a new instance RDS in a new region using the snapshot uh, from the original region that we deployed to. With GovCloud, when we're talking about the partition, we cannot go across that partition boundary with those resources. So if we are in the commercial regions and using commercial AWS and we're migrating to GovCloud, we have to move that data. And we can't rely on AWS's nice packaged you know, button to push that does it for us. We actually have to move that data ourselves uh, with more attention to detail. Not all tools just work on GovCloud. There's uh, you know, Kubernetes, there's say dozens and dozens of deployment tools. Right? Um, all of them, if you go and look at them, they are interacting with the cloud service providers, the APIs, it's in, you know, um, uh, initializing Linux networks and setting up all these hosts, doing really specific things on, the, on those clouds. Uh, GovCloud is a thing that needs its own support. So if you have a tool that deploys Kubernetes for you, it needs to support GovCloud. Uh, in addition, because that partition that we're talking about, if we're talking about an AMI or an image that is used to create some resources on AWS, um, those resources are need to be created by somebody, right? So if, if it's a tool, say uh, Kubernetes or, or our own stack or something like that that we're, run, we're running and it builds an image for us, those images need to exist on GovCloud as well. So in many cases, tools will need small updates, um, but developers aren't aware of GovCloud, um, not widely at least. And uh, so it's common that you'll say, you'll think you're using tool X and then you go to use it with GovCloud and it fails in some simple way, like, hey, I don't know that region. And then you go to your tool provider and you're like, hey, I need you to support GovCloud and they stare at you kind of weird. And they, they you know, ask for help in doing that. And sometimes they're blocked on just having access to GovCloud and they can't really test it. So they don't prioritize um, those, that, that update. Um, so not all tools will just work and knowing which tools ahead of time uh, work and which don't will save you a tremendous amount of time. 
So obviously working with people who are familiar with GovCloud and have some sort of, um, you know, experience in navigating these tools and these, these, the options that are out there uh, ends up saving a lot of time. Another thing that makes uh, GovCloud difficult is that not all AWS services are available. So if we broke down the list of services, it's, it's huge at this point, right? It's like, I don't know, dozens, hundreds, almost a hundred. Uh, you know, EC2, Lambda, uh, EKS, uh, the Docker registry, ECR, all of these different services need to be available in GovCloud regions if you want to use them, right? Like, uh, but are they? They might not be. And uh, GovCloud is a place where, you know, say like uh, managed NAT, uh, NAT gateways is a good example of first couple of years, there were no net managed NAT gateways. And eventually uh, now on GovCloud, those are available and supported. So, and during that time that it was not available, we had no idea when it would become available because AWS is very secretive. They don't really talk about this kind of stuff publicly very much. Um, and so if you're really wanting EKS, for example, you really want Elastic or, or Kubernetes up on AWS and you want that managed service, uh, if it's not available on GovCloud, you don't know when it will come and you're just waiting for it to be there. So most of the time, that's not an issue, but there are plenty of times where it is. And um, in those cases, you need to provide your own solution until the AWS managed solution is available. Or in some cases, like with Route 53, as an example with DNS, um, which DNS is a, a core you know, a need, a core component of, of all deployments on, on a cloud. Uh, Route 53 doesn't have the same type of automation and isn't available in GovCloud. And to automate uh, Route 53 means crossing that partition boundary in wonderfully complicated ways. For example, if you look into the documentation on Route 53, it will suggest that Route 53 is available on GovCloud, but what they mean is that you are using Route 53 on the commercial AWS and have an account over there and when you update your GovCloud resources, you are then using the APIs with the commercial uh, AWS to update Route 53. So Route 53 is not available on GovCloud, despite the fact that they make it sound like it is. All of this makes GovCloud a little bit more difficult to use and obviously more costly and it's in time to get up to speed in using it. So all of these uh, are just examples but really what I want to take away here is that there are GovCloud specific issues which become distractions and you really don't want to have to deal with these things. Uh, we have an agency somewhere that's saying I need to be on GovCloud by this date and you as a service provider are trying to deal with your application and, and actually handle service requests or, or requests from your clients and you've got to move this, uh, this app over to GovCloud. Uh, you don't want to then at the same time have to go wait. I was planning on using Tool X and then Route 53 and this other thing, and now that none of those will work. Uh, these are all distractions, and the best way that you can offload them or deal with them is to offload them and have somebody else help you navigate those. I'm gonna kind of spiral back around to uh, initiatives and talk a little bit more about GovCloud and FedRAMP compliance. So there's this mad rush going on, like, are you done? What, what do we mean by this? Well, there's a focus and a drive towards compliance. And as a service provider or as an engineer on the front lines deploying some you know, application or whatever, I might not even realize this is happening. And I might not even realize that there is this thing called GovCloud. But somewhere out there, there is an agency that has been told, you need to be on GovCloud. You have to have all of your IT over there. And there are leaders within these organizations at each of these agencies that are responsible for that. They are not IT people and they are looking to get things done. They don't know what it costs or what it would take to make it happen, but they need to make sure it happens within their budget and their time frame. So uh, the legislation exists and it's there and they've got to make that change and it's completely decoupled from what it is that needs to change or move or migrate to. And at the end of it, uh, they just need to see it happen, right? And they're asking then the next tier down, can you make it happen? And they're working actually across several different spheres because IT is complicated. Maybe we have a bunch of different vendors. Um, maybe we have different uh, silos where our data and applications are um, being interacted with and we have to address these separately. So 
within each of these um, efforts, we have a group of people who are constantly just trying to see this is done. They, all they want to hear is Gulf Cloud has been is complete. We're, we're on it. We've migrated. And then at the end of it, though, or on the other side of that spectrum, you've got people who are actually implementing things. And there needs to be a feedback loop and an overall plan uh, and some sort of strategy that helps drive these people together. So uh, the federal service providers, um, or sorry, federal agencies, uh, are the ones really driving this. Um, but at the end of the day, there is some inner circle of vendors that are responsible for actually making this migration happen. And they need to work together. Um, that inner circle of vendors might be only just a couple people, um, or it might be large, or a large number of, group, uh, of, of providers. Um, but the point is that there isn't one. And it's not possible for any service provider to just make them move over to GovCloud. Um, at least any real world scenario that we're dealing with. There's plenty of maybe new startups that could consider going to GovCloud, but being compliant still is its own work. Um, putting that all aside, the vast majority of us are in a migration, right? We're, we're moving some data and some application from existing hosting provider or on the cloud or not, and it's going into GovCloud. So there needs to be some group of vendors which work together to make that happen. Now, often, you know, AWS, for example, will participate, and they'll, they'll give you, um, give the agency and or the service provider uh, different people, engineers, who are on call and available uh, for answering questions and helping you make this migration happen. There are other players that play a role too, though, um, in the sense that you need to be able to offload some of your, your uh, requirements or some of the instructions that we were talking about to somebody that you can learn. So let's talk a little bit about levels of compliance and where we might fit within uh, the impact levels and what we mean by risk. So if FedRAMP, um, if we break down levels of compliance and what we're talking about here, we have three different levels and all products and, and cloud service um, providers are really, their products and their offerings are broken down into these three different impact levels. Um, as an agency or as a service provider, we are um, basically, we gotta categorize ourselves here. We gotta, we gotta say, you know, is my data important enough to be in moderate or high? Or am I dealing with a low uh, impact level? And each of these levels then determine the specifics of um, compliance and what uh, regulations we actually have to um, abide by. In particular, um, there's three objectives that these, that the levels of compliance and, and the, the sort of uh, impact level is taken into account. And the risk, the thought here is about risk. And it's about risk in, in um, say, disclosing uh, personal information or having uh, the data actually modified and, and or destroyed. Um, these different objectives and availability of the data, these three objectives are the point of whether or not, uh, or are different impact levels. So the low, moderate, and high impact levels uh, add increasing levels of security to improve and ensure uh, those three objectives are met. Uh, for the different groups of agencies that are data to protect. All right. Let's talk about making our migration successful. What goes into making the migration to GovCloud successful? It's uh, really breaking down our project and having a strategy, having a way to work through uh, the project iteratively over time um, with a specific level of quality and control that, that guides the overall process, right? So there needs to be um, a roadmap. There, we need to understand our dependencies. We need to be able to map out those dependencies and uh, identify risks to um, the integrity of our quality, right? So if we're, if we're considering uh, our operational infrastructure and our, our processes as some sort of software factory. We cannot let the quality go down through this process, even though there's more that's being demanded of us, uh, and this is difficult. Um, we need to apply these recipes for success in making our migration, and that's how we maintain our quality. Um, a migration, and I guess the reason why this is important, the reason why I stress on quality is because the, the ultimate goal with a migration is that nobody even realizes that it happened. 
and or that we minimize the impact down to this tiniest little blip, like a little cutover. And so the quality and the robustness of our DevOps infrastructure, how well we apply those best practices and use infrastructure as code, that will determine how stable or reproducible our overall migration is. And the migration that we make will be of a high level of quality if we've been able to iterate and run it many, many, many times. So it's really important that we are able to easily go through that whole process. And we're not gonna be able to do that if we don't have a strategy or a roadmap or have broken down this whole project into a bunch of different components that are compartmentalized and given out to different vendors. And we rely on partnerships to make sure that we get this done as a group. A migration is like swapping out the wheels on the bus while we're traveling at 80 miles an hour down the highway. Right? We, we've heard this analogy before. It's really true. If you've done a migration, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, it's, it's an amazing experience. And there isn't a better, better analogy out there that I've thought of or found than this. And it's, it's a place where the expertise of the organization really shines, right? So, and, and as well as the, the shortcomings of the organization, because you can have stellar performers within your group, but the migration as a whole can still fail if the group doesn't work well together, right? Because what we're doing is complicated. We've got this bus, it's moving down the highway, it's going at a very high rate of speed, and we need to swap the wheels out, which are like touching the road and, and, and connected to the engine and everything is moving, and how do you do that? So in a migration in the, in the IT world, we're talking about data and the applications that process that data, and those two need to move, right? We need to switch from A to B. There needs to be a minimum of downtime when we do that switch. And we need to be sure that we haven't messed up any of the data. Users need to be able to feel that that transition was smooth and that they weren't wondering what happened during that uh, twilight zone minute when the switchover was actually happening, they saw all kinds of weird stuff. So all of this requires a workflow and some sort of organized approach to operations that is really focused on reproducibility. Our strategy really becomes important. Um, our strategy needs to be focused on the fact that this is a migration and that it's complicated, that it's, it's a costly endeavor that will take time. Uh, it's not very reasonable to say like, well, no, I think we'll be done in just a few months. It's highly unlikely. It might be that it's just a few months to get up and running uh, and it's actually gonna be a couple years to get going or to get all the way through the actual migration. Um, our strategy needs to include a roadmap and we really need to be using that roadmap to guide our future steps. We, we can't do that thing where we, we draft up a roadmap in the beginning and then we just leave it on the side. Uh, it needs to be a living document that we track in some sort of version control system and have you know, actual versions on and, and talk about with other people and reason about and uh, review and uh, use as a way of organizing ourselves. It's also really important in our strategy to apply best practices with DevOps, infrastructure as code and reproducibility. These, these uh, methods make it possible for a small group of people to ensure a high level of quality and success. And, um, and for a large group, it's, it's, it's required uh, to grow and scale that group. Um, it's not possible. You will otherwise end up with uh, silos of information where small groups of people uh, run the show and everybody else else is basically unable to get anything meaningful done. Um, and by using best practices that DevOps has to teach us, we're able to scale out that group. We can train and teach and show them how to build out uh, their infrastructure with uh, confidence. Um, your strategy also needs to include vendors and partnerships. And uh, it's, it's important to find the engineer's engineer. Uh, if, if you're on the front lines of this migration and somebody has asked you to move your app over or if a, an executive has decided, okay, we need to make, uh, make our applications available on GovCloud, uh, there's an effort that somebody's going to need to take on. And at the end of it, the people who are actually carrying out that effort are going to need engineers that they can rely on uh, to build solutions for them in their own engineering. So 
um, for a moment, I just want to kind of stress the importance of this whole DevOps revolution and this idea of, of, of uh, methods and tools and applying infrastructure as code and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, the, the specifics of this diagram are not as important like if whether we're using Jenkins or GitLab or whatever, it doesn't matter. But this idea here of having a group of people, say your DevOps team down in the left-hand corner, pushing code to some sort of Git repo or, or version control system, uh, those things triggering builds, those builds being stored in some sort of uh, artifact repository, uh, those builds maybe even then triggering some sort of Terraform or, or uh, tools which manage the infrastructure and changes to the infrastructure are then carried out through versions and specific um, plans that are reviewed and then applied with updates that eventually come back to us in some sort of communication mechanism like Slack or, or what have you. Um, this kind of a workflow is, is incredibly important in general, but when we try to make a move to God Cloud, it's imperative. Right? Like we, we no longer can do, deal with the margin of error. Uh, the, the margin has been minimized. It's, it's so small that really any small step or errors that we normally make without applying these methods would collectively overcome that budget and we, we would lose the project. So the methods that DevOps brings to us and this idea of infrastructure as code um, and even specifically the workflow and the experiences that you get using HashiCorp's tools with, with Terraform, for example, um, or anything similar to it that, that builds out on, on that um, in this paradigm. Uh, these methods and this revolution really facilitates a successful migration, whether it be to GovCloud or not. Um, it, it facilitates that operational or the operational improvements that we need to stay agile and to be able to uh, respond to the changes that the, the businesses are asking or our clients are asking of us. So GovCloud, uh, migration to GovCloud and big data, um, it's unfortunate it's also, it's, a, it's like we were talking about databases before in RDS. Uh, this is a, a necessary component within the migration. Uh, we're, we're gonna, generally we're gonna move some, some application, but that might be kind of hard. But moving the data ends up being a lot harder in com you know, comparison, relatively speaking. Um, even if, if it's only a couple terabytes of data, um, you know, say one, two, three terabytes, it doesn't seem like a lot in today's day and age. Um, but when you, when you play it all out, right, you play out the details, it's, it's, that actually has an, a serious impact. Um, for example, with GovCloud, we're talking about this partition, we're talking about a boundary. We've said that we can't just take a, say, a snapshot of our data in an S3 bucket or uh, an RDS snapshot or what have you, and, uh, and redeploy resources using that snapshot in a new region. We actually have to migrate that data, like actually copy it byte for byte across the internet. Um, that partition boundary means that we're actually going across the public internet too, or, or you know, maybe it's a VPN or some direct connect tunnels or what have you. They may be fast, they may be private, but they're still going across the internet. And again, the internet's fast, but it takes time to move data. When you add it up, when you add up several terabytes of data, even just anything under you know, 10, uh, you're talking about an initial sync that is gonna be hours. That could be anywhere from minutes to hours. Now, if you have a lot of data, a streaming data, say like you, maybe you have a GPS location service, um, or maybe you've got some sort of uh, um, you know, weather data collection app or streaming information on real-time stocks or whatever, any of these kinds of things where you've got as that data comes in, a, a migration is difficult because as that data comes in, you have something else to copy, right? So we need some sort of initial um, synchronization of the data across the two uh, parts of the, of the migration that we're going to make, the two, um, you know, from, from commercial to GovCloud, so to speak. Um, but then we're going to need to make follow-up syncs later that synchronize uh, the last little bit of, of data that has come in since. And uh, if, we're, if we want our migration to be smooth and fast, we want that downtime or that switch to be many or only a few seconds and not many minutes. So even having a sync that takes one minute or five minutes or 10 minutes could be re like really difficult to deal with or otherwise um, untenable uh, in the real world. So 
my point here is that, that these kinds of details end up requiring advanced mechanisms for syncing uh, the data and or just migrating and carrying out the migration as a whole. So if we were to step back from a migration on GovCloud as a whole and um, scope out some requirements, we'd say that you really need a team that lives DevOps and understands it, uh, understands GovCloud in particular and how to apply DevOps to GovCloud. That team also needs knowledge asserting and maintaining compliance and being able to say, I know what I'm doing to actually be compliant and to do so proving yourself to the regulators, whether it be the FDA or some sort of other um, cloud security assessor. Uh, these are things that FP Complete has experience with and can, can confidently say, you know, we've been through it, we understand what we're talking about, we understand what will be asked of us and these will not be surprises to us. We also need an experienced team that will ask the right questions, right? Because in the bigger picture, there's no clear document or step-by-step -step process that you can go through that makes this migration happen. You have to actually look at your scenario, look at the world around you, look at the compliance and what's being asked of you, ask the things that we need to do, make some more decisions based on time and, and cost and say, okay, well, this is what I'm actually really gonna do and this is the way we're gonna carry it out. And then process through that, which might mean going to a bunch of different people uh, and asking additional questions to keep facilitating that process until it's actually complete. And at the end of the day, you need an engineer's engineer. You need somebody who's going to actually ask the right questions to keep your project on track. And that's the kind of thing that FE Complete and me personally uh, as a DevOps specialist within FE Complete, this is our bread and butter within our DevOps team. We focus on how do we drive value to your team so that your team can make this project happen. And in the case of this webinar, we're talking about GovCloud and the migration there, but this applies to all of our DevOps work. And I guess our software engineering in general too, but my head's always in DevOps, so. All right, we talked before we had this quote here about AWS GovCloud and that it provides this opportunity for us to modernize leg legacy infrastructure and accelerate operational productivity. I hope you can see a little bit more clearly how this is now a good summary of what you know, GovCloud and the migration to GovCloud is really talking about um, and why it is that we can actually help you take advantage of GovCloud and how to make that, that lead, uh, that um, migration actually possible. Uh, a couple of quick products just quickly that we have um, some experience with in particular, uh, you know, not just GovCloud, um, but Azure pipelines and just DevOps in general on, on Azure. Um, we have a significant, almost a, a decade, uh, or more than a decade of experience on, on AWS, uh, commercial uh, AWS. We have um, about as much experience with Terraform um, and we've used Terraform now for seven years or so. Um, Kubernetes, um, we have built custom distributions of Kubernetes for GovCloud. We built that from the ground up using existing tools as well as made some of these our own. We love using uh, HashiCorp Vault for securing credentials. Uh, within CI or, or other cloud providers um, and just facilitating the, uh, a, a, a reasonable workflow around credential management. Uh, credentials and secrets in general within DevOps and in, in IT infrastructure is usually handled very, very poorly. Um, Vault makes this a breeze. Um, we also have a lot of experience with CI CD systems like such as uh, GitLab and Jenkins, Bamboo, um, and uh, see some others here with the HashiStack in console and Nomad, um, as well as Google. Um, for industries that, that GovCloud specific industries that FB Complete has worked within, um, we've done a lot within healthcare and, and life sciences, uh, simulations, uh, big, large compute, high throughput uh, systems that are dealing with um, biomedical information and were level three FDA uh, medical devices and had to be approved. Um, we've built cryptocurrencies and worked on financial institutions moving around around uh, their data uh, internally and, and uh, helping uh, to actually migrate off of legacy systems that, uh, in databases uh, and modernize those. Uh, we've worked with law enforcement and judicial services and records management services, um, as well as election services and voting and being able to secure their, their infrastructures and help them um, improve their systems to run uh, efficient CI/CD on GovCloud. 
And again, um, that list is really not just limited to government services, but um, GovCloud in general is also not limited to government services. Um, basically, anybody who falls under the, the healthcare, financial services, and law enforcement, judicial uh, services uh, fits within this, the sphere of GovCloud as well. So if you have an agency asking you, you might want to get on GovCloud, but if you do not have an agency asking you and you want to position yourself well for that in the future, uh, it's possible. Yes, so GovCloud and being on GovCloud is, is what you can really use to eliminate any future or current compliance concerns that you have. We have our GovCloud success program. Uh, so if you have any uh, specific questions on how to, to navigate this um, or want uh, support in just figuring out what are the, the uh, reasons why I might want to consider this or anything uh, along those lines, we'd be happy to spend some time with you and work with you through that. Yes, we made successful migrations to GovCloud. Thanks for talking with us. I think that's is that all the slides we got there. Yeah, so thank you very much, Jada. That was a very thorough uh, discussion of DevOps, uh, FedRAP compliance, and making the migration to AWS GovCloud successful. Um, um, at this point, I see some questions from the panel. Uh, one of them is how important is containerizing your app as part of a migration to GovCloud? That's a great question. Um, it, it, it needs to be considered. Um, and the re and so I want to draw a, 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 a distinction between containerizing and also uh, shifting to Kubernetes. So going to Kubernetes is not necessarily the best idea. I mean, it might be. It might be good for you and what you want to do, but it's also a complicated move. Um, on the other hand, containerizing or just getting your application to run in a container, like Docker Container or Rocket or whatever, uh, that, that's definitely worth considering. And you don't necessarily have to use uh, Kubernetes to, to do that, to facilitate that. So the reason why containerizing is important and is worth evaluating is that it might actually be the easiest way if you get an amount of IT legacy uh, or, or you know, uh, weight that you don't want to carry uh, in that migration, it might be the easiest way to isolate and um, containerize, if you will, a bunch of complexity uh, for the app's deployment. Um, at the same time, it might be more than you want to bite off and chew. So it really depends on your team and what you have available to you. Um, you know, this is a place where Working with a vendor who has a lot of experience switching over to Docker or something like that is, um, is, is obviously a really good idea, especially if you haven't made any steps or major steps towards working with Docker or if you see working with containers in your organization is, is taking off kind of slowly or has been difficult or to be um, in different uh, areas of agreement, or if some of them really like Docker and others are like really not liking it, uh, these are the kinds of places where it's worth really looking at the, the strategy of, of containerizing and how you're going about it and how uh, in making those migrations uh, is, is really key because this is definitely one of those areas of DevOps that's touching on the, you know, the technical and, and the, the dev stuff as well as the soft skills and, and the people part of, of DevOps. I see another question. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you already have a compliance requirement on FIPS 199 or NIST 800 series, how well are you in, how do you know how well you're in compliance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if you already have those requirements on you, um, it's, and you've done a lot of work to, to abide by them and, and to maintain that compliance, then you know, obviously your gap will be pretty small for, for GovCloud or for FedRAMP compliance in general. Um, but even for an organization that has 100% compliance with those standards, that doesn't mean that they are all of a sudden just, you know, GovCloud or FedRAMP compliant and otherwise good to go. Um, it might mean that it's a lot easier, um, but in general, most of us also aren't 100% compliant and um, there's something that's going to be GovCloud specific. So where, though this matters, uh, I guess, is that 
you know, for some, for an organization that, that is in that position, they are not in the same position as somebody who hasn't done that at all. So they're going to be further along and they might need to update different processes uh, within the organization as opposed to putting those processes in place. So those kinds of things are going to need to be evaluated as well. Uh, I see they also ask, are there problem areas you want to typically focus on? Problem areas. Ooh, um, I guess some of that would be application and organization specific, or you know, specific to the scenario that we're talking about migrating. Um, we've seen clients that needed to migrate an app uh, for one of the agencies. Um, we've also seen uh, a new or, or different uh, uh, service providers or application providers, products providers, if you will, uh, who want to make their product available in GovCloud, and there's nobody uh, forcing them to make that move. So uh, these two scenarios are very different, and um, you know, obviously both of them have some sort of migration to GovCloud component, and um, the what you would focus on or prioritize across them would be a little different. And, and I'd say most most people are probably in this situation where, uh, it, well, it's one of those two, right? You're either being asked by an agency to make sure you're on GovCloud, or you're realizing that you should position yourself well within the industry and getting your product on GovCloud is what you want to do. Um, so I would maybe um, prioritize um, several different things a little differently there. One, if I were working on uh, doing this for an agency, obviously their timeline for that migration and meeting that timeline and um, otherwise communicating how far along you're on that and or finding ways of um, identifying risk ahead of time. It's, it's really important, for example, in that migration to, uh, for an agency to meet their deadlines. If you want to meet those, those, that timetable, you're going to really need to understand the unknowns. You're going to need to identify the unknowns early. Uh, the, the unknown unknowns, too. not the known unknowns, but the unknown unknowns. So all of that needs to be mapped out ahead of time as much as possible and as early in the project as possible. Uh, whereas a, a product that is going to be deployed to GovCloud as a new offering and for positioning yourself well within the industry, uh, I, would, I would focus maybe more on um, how quickly you could get your product actually on GovCloud in a reusable form and getting feedback from either clients that are going to need to use it and maybe what problems they're going to run into um, and or just finding the way to navigate how your developers are going to be running the application and or testing or doing all that CI CD on both a commercial and a GovCloud um, offering. All right, so I see one more question here that a few people are asking. Uh, are there preparation steps that you would recommend uh, organizations should take to begin working with an FP complete team? A preparatory steps before working with somebody, some a vendor like FP complete. Uh, yeah, I think internally you can, you can assess uh, where you need support. Um, you can, you can review. I think one of the things that's challenging about migration uh, of this magnitude or, or even just adopting DevOps in general one of the challenges here is that you're going to have a lot of different people with differing opinions on what DevOps is or means or the best way to go about it. And for anyone who's focused on, you know, say, hurting the, the software engineers, the, the cats, so to speak, and keeping everybody on, on point and otherwise making sure that the organization is successful, um, you, you need to understand where everybody's at and where the weaknesses are within the organization. So for example, you might have a couple people who are very tied to a particular way of doing things um, and they are really interested in uh, seeing their vision through. Um, and you, that might be a competing idea to another group. Um, and these two groups might be battling it out internally. And uh, if you're not aware of this kind of stuff internally, it can be very difficult to bring in the vendor and then see through the changes that you want to, to have happen. Uh, and it might mean that you also um, separate out any kind of um, potential discord or, or disagreement or any potential um, confusion even about how to go about this um, by establishing a platform team. So um, I think this would probably be the core of my recommendation. If you don't already have a platform team and you're looking at adopting DevOps but haven't really made that shift, 
the thing that is internally to the organization is uh, what I consider or call the platform team. And this is a team of engineers who are highly skilled, very experienced uh, systems engineers and DevOps personnel. Maybe they have a software background or, or a mix of software and uh, Linux or, or Windows Server, that kind of stuff. And these people are responsible for defining the platform that the, the product and application run on and uh, that IT is responsible for running. So this, this group takes as their users, they are servicing the developers and um, their clients, so to speak, that they uh, help also deploy to uh, or you know, deliver to is the IT team. Uh, or operations teams who are responsible for for running the platform that the apps are deployed to. So this team uh, internally, we've seen numerous uh, numbers. I'm sorry, <laughs> several times we've seen uh, clients who did not have a platform team who really needed help making this type of migration and/or just applying DevOps internally. Um, sometimes they were already applying it, but they needed to apply it better, and other times they weren't applying it at all. And in, in all cases, by establishing the platform team, which was a, a group of internal you know, engineers, internal to your organization, uh, it facilitated those changes we wanted to see. Uh, FP Complete offered guidance and mentorship and um, code and, and just tools to the platform team. And we, we helped them define their role within the organization and handed off those responsibilities uh, those roles to that team and help them adopt them and understand them and live them and um, really meet the rest of the organization's needs um, by being that go-between uh, that sits between developers and the operations teams. Well, thank you, Jay. Um, I would like to take this time to thank everybody for taking your time to attend this, Gov this GovCloud webinar. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time to learn more about DevOps compliance and making a migration to GovCloud. If you have any further questions or your organization organization is interested in receiving help from FP, FP Complete, contact us at fpcomplete.com slash contact us. Again, thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate your thorough discussion into this uh, pressing uh, new technology of uh, GovCloud. Thank you, everybody. Sure, thank you. All right, take care.